O oh God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Jesus offered one sacrifice for sins and took his seat forever at the right hand of God. Now he waits until his enemies are placed beneath his feet. By one offering, he has forever perfected those who are being sanctified. The Lord is risen, alleluia, alleluia.
Let us call upon Christ the Lord, who died and rose again, and lives always to intercede for us. With a joy in our hearts, let us call upon Christ the Lord, who died and rose again, and lives always to intercede for us. Victorious King, hear our prayer. Let Israel recognize in you her long, her long for Messiah and the whole earth be filled with the knowledge of your glory. Victorious King, hear our prayer. Keep us in the communion of your saints and grant us rest from our neighbors and their company. Victorious King, hear our prayer. You have triumphed over death, our enemy. Destroy in us the power of death that we may live only for you, victorious and immortal Lord. Victorious King, hear our prayer. Savior Christ, you were obedient even to accepting death and were raised up to the right hand of the Father. In your goodness, welcome your brothers and sisters into the kingdom of your glory. Victorious King, hear our prayer. Let us now pray with confidence the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. For thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let us pray. God our Father, look upon us with love. You redeem us and make us your children in Christ. Give us true freedom and bring us to the inheritance you promised. We ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your Bless be the name of the Lord. Now and forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Hallelujah. 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 everyone to uh, this evening's uh, Lecture Divina, which will be a combination of a few things uh, this evening, um, um, mainly the Book of Tobit, uh, but a few other things as well. And I'm realizing this is May and June. We have uh, our final Lecture Divina for the year, and then uh, July and August we take off and start again in September. And so I would like to uh, solicit uh, suggestions from you. Uh, if you have any ideas of portions of scripture, usually there need to be 10 of them uh, because uh, we do one you know, every month for 10 months. 
Uh, and uh, I've, done the, I've done the Ten Commandments, not the commandments themselves, but ten portions of Scripture that reflect on them. I've done ten Psalms, uh, like this here. We've done Psalms and Canticles, ten people of the Old Testament, maybe ten people of the New. I'll think of something, but if you have any ideas, just, just let me know. Um, also, um, this evening, uh, as we're meditating upon the Word of God, I also want to um, say a few things. We'll be talking about one of the Canticles, and uh, it's, a, it's a form of, uh, it's like a psalm that's not in the Book of Psalms. Canticle means simply a song, and that's basically what the Psalms mean. So what we'll be looking at is the canticle at the end of uh, the Book of Tobit, chapter 13 of the Book of Tobit, and largely because what only one chunk of it will fit on the, um, uh, on the sheet. Um, we're gonna go first one to eight, but as with last, uh, last month, I may go and do the whole thing. Uh, it's basically a song of rejoicing at the end of this uh, great book of the Bible. Uh, but while I'm uh, here, I might as well uh, mention to you that if you're interested, uh, I have uh, just this week put out a um, pastoral letter called Heart Speaks to Heart. Um, this, of course, this term, cor ad cor loquitur, heart speaks to heart, was chosen by uh, Cardinal Newman uh, when he became a cardinal. John Henry Newman chose that, and it comes from the writings of uh, St. Francis de Sales, uh, who, in speaking about preaching, said, the lips speak to the ears, but heart speaks to heart. And I think it uh, particularly is relevant to us as we reflect upon the, uh, the theme, very deep in our faith, of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Uh, I've mentioned that on different occasions on Good Friday, and most appropriately, because that is the, the day from which our devotion to the Sacred Heart comes. Uh, and also a few other times before that, uh, in the uh, Day of Recollection for the Priest during Lent, and also on Laetare Sunday. But I have for quite some time been more and more convinced that to deal with the struggles we face in our world, uh, many of them, COVID having brought them out, the pandemic brings them out in great, uh, great pain, but others as well. We are people who have become disintegrated. We have the integration of our relationship of love with God and with one another has been broken up a lot. Uh, this is obvious uh, in the things we face in the restrictions of the pandemic. We're all kind of broken up into little groups and we're to be of all things uh, distant and wear masks to hide us from one another, not the purpose, but that's the effect of it. All kinds of things that break us up and frustrate our natural desire to come together in relationship with one another, which of course is seen most profoundly on this earth until we see the Lord face to face in the celebration of the sacraments, most especially of the Holy Eucharist, and we are calm union, we come together, and we are temporarily impeded from that out of concern of the health officials for the spread of the virus, and I understand their reasoning. Uh, although we have uh, provably uh, maintained uh, ways of celebrating the sacraments which have not led to a spread, but I understand they are very overwhelmed by the especially the new variants. But so it's all there, but it's other things as well. Uh, we have a great deal of division in our society, a great deal of a kind of a sharpness. We notice this in all kinds of ways in politics, in the technology we have. We become, for a world that has never been more connected, we even have internet friends of all things and yet are those truly friends? Is that what friendship means? Or have we not yet become perhaps islands all huddled over our little screens, superficially connected, relating to one another, and yet in fact isolated? There never has there been more loneliness. All the lonely people is more relevant now than when the Beatles wrote the song. And yet in this world when we're supposedly super connected, has anyone thought there's a problem here? Could it be that the, perhaps the modern um, a recipe for society is wrong? Could it be there are other ways, other places where we can search for wisdom, which will draw us together in love and where we will find peace for our hearts. Whereas St. Augustine said so long ago, 
You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless till they rest in you. And so in all of that, in the exaltation of the ego, the icy islands of autonomy, I did it my way, the sense of my life, my body, my this, my that. And among priests, we even get priests talking about my priesthood. I was saying to priests, don't worry, guy, you don't have a priesthood, it belongs to Jesus Christ. So <laughs> relax. Uh, we're into this kind of a thing. And so in that world, we need to recognize that ultimately true peace and happiness comes from our relationships of love based upon the Blessed Trinity. And that's what our Lord showed us by coming amongst us, even to death on the cross. And that's what we see in the sacred heart of Jesus. We see the head, the heart, and the hands, the vision of God's plan, the service of others, but in the center of it all is that affective center of love and relationship which comes from Christ and which we are called to imitate. He reaches out to us. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He is our good shepherd. He cares for us. And when we look at him on the cross, we see the sacred heart of Jesus. We see the heart in the traditional symbols of this, the heart, which is faithful love, the wound, because that sometimes involves suffering along with the crown of thorns. It's not a theoretical love of words, simply words, words, foolish words. And the cross above it, because it's only in sacrificial love that we find God and ourselves. If we forget ourselves and love others, we will find ourselves. And there's a fire all around the heart, the fire of love, divine and glorious. And so I have reflected on that a fair bit and uh, I offer to you, if you find it of any value and help, I hope it will be of some service to you. It relates to our, and obviously our initial struggles are right now with the isolation we face in this particular pandemic. But more than that, the kind of spirit of the age which divides us into sterile little islands of autonomy, of meanness, the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. And the sometimes reaction to it, not in the love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is the model for true love, faithful, deep, and true, but a false compassion that is really sentimentality it is the heart without the head. It is simply an emotional reaction. And when we operate on the basis of that, great harm can be done. I see that in the replacement sometimes, even in our, our Catholic teachings, sometimes in our schools, of the real compassion of Christ with a kind of a secular sentimentality, which really is not guided by anything. It's like having a car with an engine, but no steering wheel. And uh, that doesn't have a happy ending. And so all of these things we face. And so I uh, commend to you, I think, uh, this, the image, the vision of the Sacred Heart of Jesus uh, for many reasons in our society, maybe particularly in the sufferings we go through in this pandemic. And uh, we're in the month of May, the month of Our Lady, but we're coming up to the month of June. And for Catholic Christians, the month of June is a very special month. It is a month in which we every year celebrate the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. This year it's on June the 11th. It's always connected into Corpus Christi, which is behind Pentecost, and so it ends up there. A Friday, because it's connected to Good Friday. So anyway, I just uh, urge you to do that, and I ask all individuals, parishes, schools, every institution to focus as Christians disciples of the Lord Jesus who gave his life for us to focus, especially during the month of June, upon his love for us, which is symbolized in the Sacred Heart of Jesus. This evening, we're also going to be talking about a similar theme. We're gonna be meditating upon the book of Tobit, which with perhaps the other one would be the, the Song of Songs. Of course, he has love poetry, the Song of Song, and it's originally human love poetry, but exalted and uh, 
put in a new context, love poetry, which uh, speaks to us of the love we have for God and God for us. So that's obviously a thing that deals with the great sacrament of love, uh, which is the sacrament of holy matrimony. And that, of course, is where heart speaks to heart in a very powerful way. And um, in that reality of the sacred covenant between a man and a woman, faithful in love and open to the gift of life, there is, then there comes another beating heart as the father and the mother become with God, co-creators, a little child who is immortal. Think of it, humans can, with God's grace, create a creature who is immortal forever, eternity, bound for the heavenly city of Jerusalem. That is amazing. And so we, we look, I think, to the Song of Songs. We also look to the Book of Tobit. The Book of Tobit speaks to us of heart speaks to heart, not in the sense of the sacred heart of Jesus and the suffering and death of the Lord on the cross, but rather of the sacrament of matrimony. It is a book which uh, is in the deuterocanonical books. It has 14 chapters, it's very short. Uh, I, I left up in my room and I've been meditating on it, the, uh, the, um, my copy of the Collegeville. Um, they, they have a little booklets for every book of the Bible. Uh, but here it is, this is the length of the book of Tobit. There it is. So it's just a short little book. I highly recommend, let's read it. And what it does is it talks about so many wonderful things. And those little 14 chapters, we're gonna meditate upon, just briefly, on, we'll do a little lecture divina on the um, 13th chapter, a great song of praise to God by Tobit, thanking God for his graces. We see so much. We have Tobit, and uh, he is a, a virtuous man. Uh, he is, uh, he and his, his wife, uh, uh, Anna, and he has a son, uh, Tobias. And Tobit and Anna are living in exile, as so many of the uh, Jewish people were called to do. And he is a man of great virtue. Uh, their marriage is a model of uh, love for one another and love for their beloved son, Tobias. Uh, Tobit does great deeds of goodness, but he is blinded in a, a kind of an accident thing, which is described in the book. And uh, he needs uh, help, he needs money uh, for his family. So he sends his son Tobias off to retrieve some money that is far, far away in a distant land. Meanwhile, back in the distant land, we have uh, uh, Raguel, uh, who is there, and his wife Edna, and their daughter Sarah. And Sarah is married to, gets married, and to seven different husbands, and all of them die on the first night of the marriage because a demon is attacking them, which, to be put up mildly, is rather discouraging for one and all. And so she doesn't know what to do, and there we are. It's a great tragedy. And so Tobias sets off to find the money that his father Tobit needs to support the family and to find some way of curing his father's blindness. And as he's led on his journey, it's a great adventure of love. And by the way, one little thing for dog lovers, as they go out the door, that his pet dog follows after him. I think it's the only reference to um, a pet <laughs> in the Bible, probably. Anyway, off they go with a little dog running behind. Uh, and uh, he has this man, he thinks it's named Azariah. It's actually the angel Raphael who's come, sent by God to answer to the prayers of Tobit and answer to the prayers of Sarah, the young lady far away. Their prayers have come before the throne of God. So God sends Raphael in disguise and he guides Tobias on his distant journey, adventures all the way. I mean, this is a book that's just, it's a page turner. I don't know, I don't know anyone's ever made a movie out of it, but they should. But anyway, they get, they get to, Raphael and Tobias get to this distant place and uh, it's a beautiful wedding. They, uh, he, Tobias falls in love with Sarah and there's a special prayer and blessing and ceremonies by which the demons are driven away. And we have a beautiful thing called the night of Tobias when Sarah and, uh, and Tobias on their wedding night consecrate their marriage in prayer. 
and then uh, they begin their life and their family and their life together. It's a beautiful, beautiful story of love. Heart speaks to heart in, a, in the sacrament of holy matrimony. And eventually they come back home, and I won't fill you in with all the stories, but um, they, they go through many adventures, and uh, finally they reach back home. And Tobit, at the beginning, has offered a prayer to Almighty God, help me in my blindness, help me in my struggle. Sarah has offered a prayer to Almighty God, help me, Lord, in this terrible tragedy in my life. And finally, when, Tobit, uh, when Tobias gets back home, bringing Sarah, his new wife, and all kinds of wealth and prosperity, uh, Tobit finally writes and sings a, a prayer of rejoicing. And that's the little section of that is what we will meditate upon tonight. Uh, so I, I recommend read the little book of Tobit. It's, uh, it's just wonderful. And especially, uh, I think it's important in these days when we need to emphasize the sanctity of marriage, uh, to have this wonderful wedding story. It's marriage is love story. It's just beautiful. We have others in Genesis as well, but this is a whole book based upon uh, a faithfulness of the old Tobit and, uh, and his wife Anna, the love of Tobias and Sarah, uh, mother, father, their, their daughter and their son falling in love. It's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, and it's a reference to Raphael. Uh, we think of Michael here. If you look behind here, you see Michael and there's Gabriel, but there's Raphael over there. Raphael always has a fish in his hand. This is a little bit of useless information, uh, a fish. Because in the story of Tobit, the fish comes and it's used in various ways, the heart of the fish and so on, as part of the medicine to cure Tobit at the end. And so Raphael, which means basically, Michael means, Mikael means God, who is like God. Gabriel means warrior of God, God is my warrior. And Raphael means God heals me, it's the healer. And so there we are. Let's uh, now begin meditating upon this canticle, which is a song like a psalm, except it's not one of the 150 in the book of Psalms. Uh, when we pray the divine office here, we, we have the psalms, the whole thing is made up of psalms, but also in um, morning prayer, we have a canticle from the Old Testament, like Tobit, and in evening prayer, we have a canticle from the New Testament. And every day we have three canticles in morning prayer, the Benedictus, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, he's come to his people and set them free. In evening prayer, which we just prayed, the Magnificat, we sang, and that's when you do it formally, I go around and incense the altar. And before going to bed, just before flicking out the lights, um, we have the canticle of Simeon. Now, Lord, let your servant go in peace. So those are canticles, and this is a canticle of thanksgiving to God for his blessings in a time of great struggle. So we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us. Help us to know your will. Free us from all our sins that block the pathway to our heart. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Then Tobit wrote a prayer of rejoicing and said, Blessed is God who lives forever and blessed is his kingdom. For he afflicts and he shows mercy. He leads down to Hades and brings up again. And there is no one who can escape his hand. Acknowledge him before the nations, O sons of Israel, for he has scattered us among them. Make his greatness known there and exalt him in the presence of the living because he is our Lord and our God. He is our father forever. He will afflict us for our iniquities and again he will show mercy. He will gather us from all the nations among whom you have, we have been scattered if you turn to him with all your heart, with all your soul, to do what is true before him, 
then he will turn to you and will not hide his face from you, but see what he will do with you. Give thanks to him with your full voice. Praise the Lord of righteousness and exalt the King of the ages. I give, th give him thanks in the land of my captivity and I show his power and majesty to a nation of sinners. Turn back, you sinners, and do right before him. Who knows if he will accept you and will have mercy on you? I exalt my God, my soul exalts the King of heaven, and will rejoice in his majesty. Bless the Lord, all you his chosen ones. All of you praise his glory. Celebrate days of joy and give thanks to him. O Jerusalem, the holy city, he will afflict you for the deeds of your sons, but again he will show mercy to the sons of the righteous. Give thanks worthily to the Lord and praise the King of the ages, that his tent may be raised for you again with joy. May he, may he cheer those within you who are captives and love those within you who are distressed to all generations forever. Many nations will come from afar to the name of the Lord God, bearing gifts in their hands, gifts for the King of heaven. Generations of generations will give you joyful praise. Cursed are all who hate you and blessed forever will be all who love you. Rejoice and be glad for the sons of the righteous, for they will be gathered together and will praise the Lord of the righteous. How blessed are those who love you they will rejoice in your peace. Blessed are those who grieved over all your afflictions, for they will rejoice for you upon seeing all your glory. And they will be made glad forever. Let my soul praise God, the great King, for Jerusalem will be built with sapphires and emeralds, her walls with precious stones, and her towers and battlements with pure gold. The streets of Jerusalem will be paved with beryl and ruby and stones of Ophir. All her lanes will cry hallelujah and will give praise saying, blessed be God who has exalted you forever. Now you notice that's a lot more than the rather brief portion that is published for today's uh, lecture of Vina. And, and in about um, 15 minutes that remain of the lecture of Vina, I'm not gonna be able to I can't meditate upon the whole of it, but I thought it would be good for you to hear the whole of it. That's the whole of chapter 13 of the book of Tobit. Read the whole book of Tobit. So let's just uh, meditate a little bit upon it and uh, look at the end of it, but I won't get to the end of it by any means. Notice he talks about how he dreams of Jerusalem. He was in exile and he was in Nineveh. This is written as an exile yearning for home. And he speaks, there is a Jerusalem, but come will come a time when it has emeralds and sapphires and things like that. It's picked up in the book of Revelation as a description of the heavenly city, Jerusalem, which is ultimately where we're all headed uh, in the midst of our afflictions in this valley of tears. We need to be homeward bound to Jerusalem. That's why I always say that at a funeral, the final hymn, should be about Jerusalem, heading home, the heavenly city, the city of God. And in the end of the New Testament, this vision of the city studded with jewels, uh, and that is the real vision of heaven really, um, is picked up from here. However, let's look at a little bit of this. And we won't go very far because uh, it would take a couple of hours to meditate upon the whole of this, and I encourage you to do that at home. He starts off, blessed is God who lives forever, and blessed is his kingdom. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. Blessed is God. We give thanks for the glory of God. We bless other people, that's a prayer. A prayer of blessing is a prayer of relationship. Parents bless their children. And a spiritual father, like a priest or a bishop, blesses his spiritual children. It's a prayer of blessing based on relationship. But when we bless God, we're not blessing God as if we are his parent or something, but we are saying praise, many praises be given to God. We need to thank God for his, his graciousness to us. And to recognize, as we see also in the book of Job, there's a lot of Job in Tobit, poor Tobit and Job, just men, good men. There's a lot of connection here. 
and they could just get destroyed. Oh my gosh, poor Tobit does nothing but good, and he ends up being blind and in desperate need. Not as much as Job, but he did quite a bit. So he says, for he afflicts and he shows mercy. He leads down to Hazes and brings up again. And there is no one who can escape his hand. The sense of surrender to the hand of God. Let me be a feather on the breath of God. That's a very good way to approach life because you never know what tomorrow's gonna bring. You know, the pagans would have like the roll of the wheel of fate. You know, you're up and then you're down, you're back up again. And we really don't know. Uh, that's why my favorite hymn, which sort of, I, I, I love it, because it's beautiful music and it's really beautiful words. And it says, for whether our tomorrows be filled with good or ill, we'll triumph through our sorrows and rise to bless you still. That's what we say, that's what we pray. And so in our life, especially as we're going through a time of affliction as a community, as we think of people who are suffering, and I think of this as well, within the community of the church, there's some things that I must say as a bishop, I am really concerned about, about a kind of, a, of an infiltration of secular, uh, like banality. Uh, r driving out the richness of our faith. It's another reason for meditating upon the sacred heart of Jesus. It brings us back to the real Lord Jesus. And so when we see that and we, we see this affliction, we say, Lord, give us strength. Give us strength to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, to follow you more nearly day by day. The prayer of Richard of Chesester uh, it should guide us every day. We need to see the Lord, to love the Lord, and then to follow the Lord, head, heart, and hands. O oh Lord, my God, three things I pray, to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, to follow you more nearly day by day. It's not enough to say, I love you, Lord, unless we're seeing who we're loving, unless we're doing what the implications are. That really worries me not worries me, it's in God's hands. I'm just, uh, you know, passing through. But I, it just, um, we got a lot of kind of Catholic light, as somebody once called it, and you can't live on that. I, I remember hearing, I think I've told the story before of a, a company put out baby formula and sold it in great numbers in distant lands, great quantities. There's nothing poison in it, it was perfectly healthy. But it was diluted so much when it was received that the little babies died, not because they were being poisoned, but because it was diluted so much it wasn't enough to sustain their life. So I think we've got to think about that. And one of the solutions I suggest is meditation upon the sacred heart of Jesus. Let's come something rich, not something like life-giving, something that's got nourishment, faith, love. And also, of course, the best way to do that or immediately is read the gospel the real gospel, where you actually meet the real Jesus and you can then know what would Jesus do, not the Jesus we cook up in our own imaginations. So he afflicts, he shows mercy, he leads down to Hades, he brings us up again. There's no one who can escape his hand. We're in the hands of the Lord and so we say, Lord, help me to serve you, help me to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, to follow you more nearly day by day. Maybe we can ask the Lord's forgiveness for the times we don't do that. Acknowledge him before the nations, O sons of Israel, for he has scattered us among them. Make his greatness known there and exalt him in the presence of all the living because he is our Lord and God, he is our Father forever. This was written in a spirit of exile. We're all exiles, scattered among the nations. And so in that context especially, we're not yet in the heavenly city, Jerusalem, at all. We're living in, the book of Revelation says, in Babylon the Great, 
So acknowledge him before the nations, O sons of Israel, for he has scattered us among them. We need to acknowledge our faith among the nations. And what we are doing, we're living in this uh, sophisticated little world of ours. We are scattered within a kind of a secular nation which knows not God and which is basically makes uh, exaltation of the ego, it's, it's God. And any affirmation of Christian faith it is sometimes uh, treated with, uh, with uh, horror. So we need to be able to do so, but with clarity and charity and joyfully and simply serve the Lord with gladness, come before him singing for joy, but acknowledge the Lord before the nations, O sons of Israel, for he has scattered us among them. Has he ever? Make his greatness known there and exalt him in the presence of all the living because he is our Lord and God. He is our God forever. And so as Bishop Sheen said, when you fill the box with salt and there'll be no room for the pepper, fill the box with diamonds, there's no room for the sand, put it any way you want. The way we do that, we can see a lot of things that are got problems, we need to. So we need to proclaim our faith with love and just by living it to the full and politely and gently expressing it, but mostly by living it. And let it fill our hearts at least until, and then uh, put everything else in the hands of God. It's not for us to say. Uh, that's like there's a lot of wisdom in the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous prayer, which really is very much the sacrament of the present moment. You know, uh, have the courage to change the things you can, or the serenity to accept the things you cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. It's a lot of wisdom there. He will afflict us for in our iniquities, and again he will show mercy. He will gather us from all the nations among whom you have been scattered. This is the hope. And it is the reality. We have been afflicted, and yet he will show mercy. God is there with us every step of the way, just as in the story of Tobit. Even though he was living a very good life, he ended up in a horrible situation. But then his son heads off, protected as unbeknownst to them at the time by the angel Raphael. And eventually, uh, he, then we have the beautiful love of Sarah and Tobias. So in the midst of it all, I think that's so true. In the midst of the struggles, we come closer to God and we come closer to one another. This is why I think the Lord of the Rings is so powerful. It's a very powerful forces of evil, almost irresistibly spreading and crushing. And yet in the midst of it, you have the little furry footed hobbits and their friends, they're moving on. And they are having their hearts, love, faithfulness, compassion, honor, uh, and a true sense of the human person, a true sense of the, 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 the meaning of life. And they can uh, therefore, by God's providence really, uh, in the end, uh, despite a lot of evil that even keeps, always keeps popping up again, they are able to reach their goal. As Tolkien said, apart from his other famous comment that all glory, all love, all life in the world is found before the blessed sacrament, his other thing he said was that the Lord of the Rings was unconsciously Catholic in the writing of it and consciously so in the rewriting of it. So that's the spirit. Like uh, little hobbits before the dark Lord, we fear not, God is with us. If you turn to him with all your heart, with all your soul and do what is true before him, then he will turn to you who will not hide his face from you. Now, this is what our Lord picks up to us from obviously Deuteronomy, the, you know, you love the Lord your God with heart and mind and soul. If you turn to him with all your heart, with all your soul, your heart, heart speaks to heart. Heart in the Old Testament and our basic tradition, not just emotion, it's who we are. So when uh, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, Pharaoh is hardened. It's the center sign of who we are. We turn to him with all our heart. We can't use our faith as a fashion accessory. 
a kind of a tacky little add-on, an optional extra. <laughs> That's not gonna, uh, no future in that, to put it mildly. If you turn to him with all your heart, with all your soul, and do what is true before him, doing the truth. Later on, this is picked up in a different way. I don't even know whether St. John thought of this, but he may have. Doing the truth, acting rightly according to what is real, what is true, what is there. And we don't have our own little truths. You know, I have my truth, you have your truth. We all have our different truths. Be happy with yours, I'll be happy with mine, and we'll all just, some of you don't bump into one another. No, that's not right. There is a natural reality, a pattern in the universe that is there. There are things external to us that we cannot manipulate by our minds, uh, by our will, by what we want, what my truth is, comes ramming up against the truth. And we gotta re realize, because if not, we end up with a whole bunch of islands of little individual my truths and I mean, that's chaos ultimately, and it's also foolish. Uh, we have to see this. Why can we not see it? This used to be kind of obvious. Little kids can see it, unless they're corrupted by the society. If you turn to him with all your heart, with all your soul, no dipping into the pool, but all your heart and all your soul to do what is true before him, and for us, we look to the truth is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in the living faith of the church. And this was, of course, Old Testament before. Then he will turn to you, will not hide his face from you, but see what he will do with you. Give thanks to him with your full voice. Praise the Lord of righteousness and exalt the King of the ages. I give him thanks in the land of my captivity and I have show you his power and majesty to a nation of sinners. Turn back, you sinners, and do right before him. Who knows if he will accept you and will have mercy on you? Oh, that's so real. Mercy, the mercy of God. That's why like in the most beautiful litany of the Sacred Heart, anything referring to God at all, it's always have mercy on us, have mercy on us. Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. We say at the beginning of Mass, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. But mercy is, exists and flourishes and only exists in a recognition that there's something to have mercy about. You can't receive mercy if you don't think there's anything to receive mercy about. So that's why he talks about turn back you sinners and do right before him convert, uh, repent, for the kingdom of God is near at hand. Uh, that's the real Jesus Christ says that, that's his opening line. And so is the same with John the Baptist. Turn back, you sinners, repent, do right before him, who knows if he will accept you and have mercy on you. Then I exalt my God, my soul exalts the king of heaven and will rejoice in his majesty Bless the Lord, all you his chosen ones, all you praise his glory. Celebrate days of joy and give thanks to him. What a joy it is. What a blessing. What a grace. Wow. This is uh, a very little known part of sacred scripture, the book of Tobit. And yet in it, and especially in this great canticle, we don't have time to finish it really, but I invite you all. The book of Tobit, T-O-B-I-T. -T. Read it, read it, and pray it, meditate on it. Um, it. This canticle in chapter 13 is just so rich. And it's, it speaks from a situation of exile. And of course the Hebrews were in exile in different times. But we're in a kind of exile. We're not home yet. We're on our way. And we're living as strangers in a strange land, although we may not think so, but we are. If we think it's not a strange land, uh, maybe they wake up and drink the coffee. Um, yeah, we're strangers in a strange land. And therefore we have to determine what, will, what principles will we follow in our life? 
And how will we live? Will we live honorably with our hearts filled with love for the Lord and for others, guided by the vision of faith and bearing fruit in service of other people? Where compassion is suffering with someone, it's not sentimentality and saying, well, if you want it here, hey, go for it. No, I'll make you happy. What do you want? Can I make you happy? It's like, <laughs> that's not real love. You know, it's just not real love. And we've got to get beyond the shallow tackiness of our secular culture. And it's substitute for compassion, which is sentimentality. And come to the reality we hear in the word of God that cuts like a two-edged sword. And in the Lord Jesus himself, who brings us life and life abundantly. And that's what we need. And accept no substitutes. Maybe that's the way to end it, accept no substitutes. So I ask uh, everyone, just invite you to read the whole of it. I won't do it now because we're about at time's up. But I invite you to do so. It's a wonderful book. It says a lot about love, faith, service, honor, marriage, uh, Everything. It's so beautiful here. And so I encourage you to pray the book of Tobit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.